here we are at the Dragon's Den style event, bringing together the two worlds of academia and commercialism. We have five dragons from the local commerce and industry, and we have seven contestants battling it out with the dragons. What Threadbare is going to allow you to do um, via motion tracking is to actually walk as though inside an orchestra wow. and listen to a performance. So that what this means is that every time that you walked uh, in a different route with a different duration, you'd be able to listen to the same piece of fixed digital content in a different way. It's a way of bringing the digital to life. Wow, this sounds incredible. So what are the applications for something as this? I mean, we speak about orchestras, but surely it's got applications elsewhere as well. Well, that's my interest. I've been composing in the digital studio for a long time, and you can, com you can compose very complex sound that can't really be heard on speaker systems. So my interest as a producer of music is to really elucidate the content of complex things that I'm making and that other composers are working with. But, of course, it's got much wider applications than that in heritage, tourism, entertainment, musical training. So this is something that's both social, lots of people would be listening with handsets in their pockets, um, tracked as they move about, but listening to the audio that's specific to their location and the type of content they want to hear. So it's both social and individuated according to the movement of the listener. Superb, it sounds phenomenally complex, but, but presumably the technology exists to, to uh, make it accessible. Yes, it does. We've built a prototype which um, works with Max MSP and processing, which are two um, audio development frameworks that work on um, Windows-based PCs and Macs, but they don't work yet on iPhones, and so what we're going to have to do is translate this to a smartphone platform um, and then make it into a, a bundle that can be downloaded um, as an application with audio attached, such that the listener simply goes to the iTunes store, download a thing like an album really, as you do now, um, go to the place, click play, and that's it. You had a, a great reception I, uh, I saw, I noticed, from the, the dragons in our den here. So what, do you, what needs to happen next from your perspective? Well, we need to obtain the funding um, and win the prize, um, and then we're going to go to proof of concept stage, hopefully, with that in the next three months. Um, develop a really attractive user interface that can be uh, used by anybody without training. At the moment, it's very much a, a geek tool. Um, we want this to be something that you can drag and drop create your own um, sound walks very quickly okay. uh, and then put that straight on to um, a portable device and field test it. And I'm now giving the secret away who actually uh, won today. What's your general feel about the, the quality and what excitement or emotion did you have around the projects as they came forward to you? I think that some of the projects, the ones that sort of won particularly, um, did were inspiring. They did catch the imagination and um, we did think that they had a sort of reasonable shout of actually getting somewhere. And so the Dragons have heard all the presentations so far. They're having lunch and over lunch, we're deliberating on the winners. And in a few moments time, we'll bring you the first, second and third on today's Dragon Den event. So the Dragons have shared their ideas on who was first, second and third. So let me just tell you. And third place was Tony and Joe with an amazing project called Waterwell. And this particular project, it's about getting, democratizing the access to data on water globally. So that we can share it in a responsible manner. So everybody takes the brunt and the benefit, which is a key thing. In second place with Gary Wills and an idea called Bluepoint. And this is about making access to the internet in regional rural areas totally accessible and affordable using mobile technology. But the winner was a fascinating project. The title was Threadbare, but it's about making audio and music part of your life in a very different way. And this is from Ben Mawson. His concept was using the principle of monitoring which way you're facing, which way you're going, and with an audio track which is live and with you, you could be inside an orchestra uh, as they're playing their music. And quite a phenomenal concept, is that right? Hi, everybody. I, I think we're all here. So if it's all right with you, uh, we'll kick off. Uh, my name is Ben Mawson. I'm uh, studying for a PhD in the Department of Music. And um, I'm going to explain to you the, the, the background, the origins of an idea which I've been doggedly pursuing for a couple of years. Um, and then I'm going to move on to introduce you to um, some colleagues that I'm working with using the project. Um, so first of all, it's, uh, it's called Threadbare. Um, well, that's how we pronounce it. And I'm going to run you through. The first thing I'm going to do is show you a fairly lengthy quote, but I promise, promise it will be the only one of its kind. So Threadbare is a machine for walking inside sound. And I'm, I'm just going to read you this, and I, I want to ask you if you can tell me when you think that this was written. Today, with the technical means that exist, 
and are easily adaptable. The differentiation of masses and planes as beams of sound could be made discernible to the listener by means of certain acoustical arrangements, which would permit the delim delimitation of what I call zones of intensities, differentiated by various timbres, colours, loudnesses, and these would become agents of delineation like the different colours on a map, separating different areas and an integral part of form. These zones would be felt as isolated, and the hitherto unobtainable non-blending, or at least the sensation of non-blending, would become possible. Anybody want to hazard a guess when those words were written? 1925? Oh, cool, I like it. Uh, <laughs> any other guesses? <laughs> well, this is uh, one of my heroes, Edgar Varese, writing in 1936 about something that could then only be imagined, of course, by a visionary like him. So this is what we're trying to do. I'm going to talk to you quickly about what Threadbed does. It basically allows you to move as though inside a physical object constructed of sound. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why we might do this, because it's an idea that a lot of people think, uh, well, they haven't heard of before and they wonder why you would bother. Um, and I'm going to try to explain the rationale for this. A quick look at some of the reasons. If you compose complex music in the digital studio, you can do things that can't be done with acoustical instruments. Um, you can simulate reality, or you can simulate the plausible, which is in fact impossible. When you want to listen to this music on loudspeakers, you're basically back in a situation where you're listening to a CD on uh, a system that can't possibly render reality to you. It's tangibly artificial and very limited in what it can convey. Let's look at what happens at an acousmatic concert. We have a series of seats arranged again. Looks a bit odd, it's a fisheye lens, I think. And we've got four speakers there, more out of view. Now, the speakers are fixed, just like the violins and the oboes in the orchestra, but at least we can now send sound swirling around the audience. But the problem is that you're still in fixed relation to those sounds. So we still have, albeit something that might be using space as a layer in the music, fundamentally a fixed object, which you're presented with as though it were a physical thing, which of course it isn't. Um, let's talk about what acousmatic music means, because I've jumped in there with that term and I want to try and explain it. Music from unseen sources. That's St. Mark's in Venice. So 400 years ago, people were spreading choirs out through the church and having them singing from different areas of the cathedral, from unseen points, creating a sense of awe and wonder. And this was inspired, of course, by... Willard had started working 150 years earlier on some of the same methods. And here we've got Pierre Schaeffer, the um, French composer who arguably was the first to use samples 60 years ago, creating a piece called Symphony pour un Seul. We've got this extraordinary way of thinking about sound, and yet we've replaced the orchestra with some engineers at the front and some, or in the middle, this sort of boxing ring arrangement. But in all other respects, it's a basically like a symphony orchestra concert. We've got an orchestra in the middle and an audience around them. So this term, acousmatic, the acousmaticoi were Pythagoras' followers. And he, uh, it's repeated that he looked very odd and he didn't want people to really pay much attention to that while he was talking. So he spoke from behind a veil. And his followers, the acousmaticoi, gave Schaefer the idea to use this term in music, which for him marks perceptive reality of sound as such, as distinguished from the modes of its production and transmission. We're moving towards that. Of course, if you're watching people at turntables, you're still distracted by their action, I suppose. The sound is still mediated. But what he's talking about is the idea that we could perceive just the sound. Uh, and this is exciting for me working in the digital studio because all the respect in the world to orchestral musicians, it's simpler to work with sound as a finished object than to work with a half-imagined idea transcribed, taken to somebody and you discuss the meaning of the document and then the translation of the document into sound. It's a process I still like being involved in, but it's got its own complications. And what Schaefer is talking about here is just the sound. The first time ever these things are possible. So I might glance over that, but I'll just say from the beginning, and an opera for blind people, a performance without argument, a poem made of noises, bursts of texts, spoken or musical. 
he's admitting to his musical language sounds which were not possible to admit to the classical canon. And he's expanding the notion of what might be a musical composition. But still, like Varese, only able really to imagine what this might be like. This is stunning to me. This is a couple of years ago at a church in Berlin, already for a concert using speakers. The reason it's stunning is that it might as well be St. Mark's Venice in the 17th century. We have all of these notions about how music might be torn apart and reconstituted logically and expressively, and yet we're still sitting in a block of seats listening to sound from fixed sources, and most importantly, I think for me, uh, as a composer rather than as somebody working in sound generally, this idea that a composition is still an object, a fixed thing, like a sculpture. Of course it isn't. It's a series of intangible things, half imagined, half delivered to the, to the recipient. Um, it, it's a constant sort of struggle with the unknowable. So that this setting just like watching the Berlin Philharmonic, we're, we're treating the audience to the, to the deception that they're being given a thing. And I want to try and see whether we can transcend that. So why bother sitting down? Why even do it in a building? So this is a piece I, I, I wrote that got played on this row of 12 speakers in the window of the, the foyer of Queen Elizabeth Hall. Um, now you've got 12 pianos doing something very complex in their combination it's going to be impossible to hear what's really going on. This is a little screen capture, a moment from the piece. If you were able to hear this on its own, or coupled with that, or that coupled with that, and next time you revisited this moment to listen to what this combination did, you might be able to explore the contents of the piece um, and understand something of the perspective I was coming from in trying to combine these sounds. As it is, you hear everything together and it's not really very easy to understand what's going on at all, particularly when they're in a row like this. So here's a proposal. We spread the 12 pianos out across a space and we only make each piano audible within a given circle. So the top left piano in the green circle is only audible within that circumference, the yellow within that. So you can make them converge and I'm going to show you what might happen if you walked around the space listening. This tries to describe what you might hear over time. A second listener takes a different route and they hear a different sequence of the piece. This can be repeated ad infinitum and of course allows for infinite permutations of the combinations of sounds that we've heard. So how are we doing it? Well, we're going to relay sound to a, a wireless headset, virtually spatialized. It seems like things are over there, there, and there. And when you move around, we track you, and we inversely correlate the sound to put them back where they were, so that they, they seem to remain at the spot they were in the space. So this is where we've got to so far. After much struggle, we've got uh, limitless audio sources possible at last. We can measure your vector in space um, in order to calibrate the distance of sounds from you and we can respond to your angle of rotation. What we're looking to do now is full wireless tracking because at the moment we're doing it on a screen. Other operating systems for implementation. Um, and then we want to put it on gaming platforms. So the great thing about that will be that we can integrate surround sound with your action on a screen for example um, and do things that the gaming environment can't currently do and perhaps use the gaming environment for other applications as well with this more realistic sound. Then the room impulse response. That's the real, uh, that's the real poser. In, you know the size and shape of this room, even if you shut your eyes. And if you, if you listen to me over here, I've now, the source of my sound is now coming to you from this side of the room. And you can also tell which way I'm facing because of the resonances in the space. If I, if I talk to you like that, it changes the sound of the voice because it's reflecting off the, off the wall. And equally, if I do that or that, or if I lie on the floor, you can tell where my sound's coming from by what your ears and your brain are doing to work that out. And you're also working out what type of a space we're in. Simulating that is a challenge, and we're working on it. 
very quickly. <coughs> Build a piece of music. It runs from left to right over time. These are 51 tracks of a choral piece. The yellow line there indicates a single part, and we're going to put that in a particular spot. Each of those blue sounds, blue spots is a sound. The listener at the centre of this spider web is able, as they move around the space, to only hear those things to which they're connected by a red line. And that's the ultimate effect, that they seem actually to be walking through the musical score. So two listeners can navigate through a physical space a different experience of the piece on each occasion.